I'm gonna show you three tests that are going to totally change your ability to understand how your body's asymmetrical, how it's in balance, and what you can do to fix it. These three tests are so simple, they're so straightforward, and they're gonna tell you a lot about what's going on within your body. But a lot of people like my content on asymmetry, so I wanna spend some time today showing you three of the easiest tests you can do, but are still extremely insightful and useful. We're going to be looking at the position of the head, the rib cage, and also the pelvis. All three of these things can be rotated to either the left or the right side, respectively. For example, I could have a rib cage that's rotated to the right or to the left constantly. And I'm not aware of this because my body is used to being in this position, so it feels normal to me, but this has significant implications on how we move through the world and our posture. Think of these red squares on this Rubik's Cube as your head as the top row, your thorax or your rib cage as the middle row, and your pelvis as the bottom row. You can have your head rotated to one side, but you can have your sternum turned to another side. And then you can have your pelvis either following your rib cage or it could be rotated again to the opposite direction. So you could have different alignments of your head, your rib cage, and your pelvis. Usually the easier fixes are people who are all rotated in one direction, but once you start to get more twists and things that are out of alignment, you can start to have more complicated cases. But I wanna help you understand what yours is. These tests are a main key component of my new free ebook, The Posture Playbook, which is designed to help anyone be able to understand their own posture better and what they can do to start to improve it. So if you wanna learn what you can do about what these tests will tell you, then you can check out the link down below in the description. It is totally free and I designed it for anyone to be able to understand. Okay, let's talk about the first test. The first test is head rotation, meaning that how well can we just turn our head to one direction or the other? The side that we are naturally going to be biased towards is the side that will feel and have more degrees of rotation available to it. This will tell us where our head naturally is probably turned at all times. Again, everyone has asymmetries. It's just a matter of how much. And we also are in this sort of tall posture, but making sure that we're not flaring at our rib cage here. So we should feel like our ribs are slightly down. If you wanna know what that feels like, simply just get tall. Imagine there's a string being pulled through your head, but then get a full exhale through your mouth. <sighs> feel all those ribs come down without your sternum depressing. That would put you in a good neutral position. Now, we're gonna take vision out of this because we don't want, actually there's one more thing. The last thing to do is make sure you're feeling your sit bones evenly on both sides. So you might need to make sure you're sitting on a chair that allows you to feel some firmness to allow for that even feeling of those ischial tuberosities. Now we're gonna take the visual component out of this because that can affect our neck rotation. So Trevor's just gonna close his eyes and he's going to maintain the same plane of his head. So originally he was just looking straight ahead, closed his eyes, keep his head in the same position, and he's gonna very gently and slowly rotate his head to one side, making sure that if there was a pull going through the top of his head, he'd be rotating around that axis. And he's going to stop his head and that rotation once he hits any meaningful resistance more than about a two out of 10. Because if he pushes through that, then he's gonna start to really crank and orient his head in a weird direction we don't want, or he's gonna start to turn his shoulders. Something is going to go awry that we don't want. So he's gotta make sure everything is the same. And now he's gonna go one more time. Good. Now let's go to the other side. So for Trevor, it looks like going right is noticeably easier than going left. Is that what you feel, Trevor? Yeah. It's hard to measure your rotation of your neck from side to side, so I encourage you to just go off of which side is easier. The second test is shoulder abduction. Now this one is a test for which direction your trunk is likely rotated towards and has an easier time rotating towards. And the side that we have an easier time doing this on is the side that we're probably turned towards. So if I was turned to the right side, then I'm probably gonna have an easier time bringing that arm behind me and a harder time on the left side. In many of these cases, when a trunk is turned towards one direction, we have a lower shoulder on that side as well. With shoulder abduction, the goal is about 45 degrees. That would be a healthy range of motion. And again, if you're having a hard time determining which side is better, go off of feel or film yourself. So we're gonna start in this 90-90 sideline position, meaning we have a 90 degree bend at both our knees and our hips. 
Now to start the assessment, Trevor is going to take that top arm and he's going to reach it for the ceiling directly so his fingertips are aiming straight up there. The other hand is supporting his head like he's taking a nap. So his neck should be neutral. It shouldn't be too far forward or too far back. It should be nice and in line with his rib cage and his pelvis. Now this is very simple. All he has to do is just very slowly start to have that arm abduct and translate backwards slowly until the point where you see his sternum start to turn and that is where the movement is coming from. So it's important that we're getting dissociation from his humerus relative to his trunk. So one more time, we'll go to the genuine motion right about there and beyond there we'll see Trevor start to need to use his sternum to turn him more. So that's why we want this top-down view. It'll give us a really good representation of his genuine range of motion. The two most common mistakes on this involve the position of the arm. So other than looking for the sternum, the other thing we want to do is make sure that the arm stays at the same plane the entire way on the way down. So Trevor goes down, he wants it to be nice and in line. If it drops lower, then he can cheat it and show more range of motion than he actually has. The other thing that can go hand in hand with that is that his palm will start to rotate down towards the floor and he can again cheat more range of motion there. So make sure that your palm is facing the ceiling as you go down. The other thing to look out for in the setup is that they're starting with their shoulders stacked directly on top of each other. You're not starting open like this because then you're starting in an end range position in a compensatory position. So we don't want that. Make sure that you start with those fingertips up at the ceiling, shoulders nice and square. If this is starting to make sense to you, it would mean a lot to me in the channel if you could smash this video with a thumbs up. I would really appreciate it. And also let me know in the comments below, how is your posture? I'd really like to know how many of you are more left or right biased. The last test is pelvis rotation. This will tell us which direction our hips can turn towards more easily. And this is something that's very important to appreciate because if my pelvis rotation is significantly better in one direction, then I'm probably turned towards that direction somewhat in my resting normal posture. And that can mean that I have a hard time turning out of that side. So for example, if I had, let's stick with the right side, a pelvis that was rotated to the, to the right side at all times, that would indicate so for example, let's stick with the right side. If I had a pelvis that was constantly rotated to the right side, that would indicate to me that I would probably have a hard time pushing out of that side after I load my body weight onto that side in normal gait or running or other activities in the gym, a lot of different things. And this can have implications on overloading that side. Potentially, I might have a painful low back on my right side because I can't get out of it. I'm constantly overloading that side or my knee, or I can't shift over to the left side and I can't get in my left side. So my left low back starts to hurt because that side's always arched and pushed forward. What we're gonna do is lay on our back on the ground with our arms directly out to our sides, perfectly relaxed on the ground. And we're gonna pull our feet as close to our butt as we realistically can without feeling any tension in our knees, but also still keeping both feet perfectly flat on the ground to start. So that's gonna vary depending on the individual. But we need to keep the knees together throughout this test. So Trevor's just perfectly relaxed and all he's gonna do is he's going to take his knees off to one side and he's gonna let them kind of fall. He might have to push them a little bit, no more than about a two out of 10, but he's gonna reach a point where he needs to start to lift the opposite side shoulder off of the ground. He's gonna be tempted for that to start to happen. He needs to stop the test before that shoulder starts to lift. So you might need to do it a couple of times to get an idea for when that is for you, but we'll do that one more time. Trevor, stop just before that shoulder wants to come off of the ground, right there, perfect. Now let's go to the other side and compare from side to side. One side will very likely feel easier than the other. There you go. So for him, going right is easier than going left. A couple of things to keep in mind here is that as Trevor goes to one side, let's go to the right, the left foot's gonna come off of the ground, totally normal, just like that. And his left low back is gonna come off of the ground. But what we're really paying attention to is this left shoulder right here. If that happens, you went too far. So let's go back and let's stop at the right moment there. Boom, right there. Now the way we measure this is by the crease of the knees. So if we go back to the top there, 
When the knees are pointing straight up at the ceiling, that's zero degrees. Any additional range of motion would be taken via the crease of the knees relative to that starting position. So right about there, that would be around maybe 70 or 75 degrees. For pelvis rotation, you're looking for about 70 degrees in an ideal range of motion.